Welcome to Action Station's Fireside Chat about why we need to guarantee everyone a basic income and a secure home. I'm Michelle Acourt. I'm delighted to be with you all. I really miss being able to gather in large groups in one room, but we're all getting used to a new way of doing things. It's, it's kind of bananas, I think. Um, but we've been fast learners. Uh, we've learned a whole lot of new words and phrases in the last month. Uh, I didn't know in February what social distancing was or flattening the curve, community spread. I didn't know what PPE was. I Bubble was a completely different thing in my world. Um, and epidemiologist, my father-in-law is an epidemiologist and uh, after 20 years, I now know what he does, which is delightful. So it turns out that we can be really quick to adapt and we're capable of change, which means now is a great time to talk about other new ways of doing things. So like I say, the way all of us live and work has changed radically and very rapidly. 40% of our workforce is now reliant on the government's wage subsidy and hello, I'm one of the 40%. Uh, Treasury estimates that unemployment could reach as high as 26%. And while some people are talking about rebuilding paradise in a post-COVID world, it's, um, I think it's really worth remembering that our pre-COVID world wasn't paradise for everyone. And we can do better than going back to the way it was before. So this is a crisis, but it's also an opportunity. The next, for the next hour, we're going to talk about a basic income, what that looks like, how it works, how we pay for it, and who it helps. So I want to introduce you to our four fabulous panellists for the evening. Sue Bradford is an educator for Kotari Research and Education for Social Change in Aotearoa. Sue is a lifelong community activist and a former Green MP. She's a queen. She uh, has a PhD in public policy. She's been a supporter of progressive forms of basic income for 30 years, seeing this as a long-term structural solution to poverty and unemployment. We also have with us Phil Stevens. Give him away, Phil. Uh, Phil has many strings to his bow and he possibly literally has a bow, I don't know, but I know that he works in music and recording and IT as well as carbon management and regenerative systems. Right now he gives development support for Community Forge, which is an open source software platform used by hundreds of trading communities around the world. So Phil chairs the Living Economies Educational Trust, which provides information and support for community-based economic solutions. Uh, also with us this evening, we have Isabella lenahan Eiken. Uh, Isabella is the National President of the New Zealand Uni Union of Students Associations, NDUSA, which represents tertiary students at universities and polytechs in Aotearoa. Isabella is a current Rhodes Scholar and is about to begin a Masters of International Health and Tropical Medicine, fo focusing on health impacts of climate change at Oxford University. And we also have with us Laura O'Connell Rapira, who is the director of Action Station, which is, as you probably know, because you're here with us right now, an independent community action group representing over 100,000 New Zealanders to help us create what we can't achieve on our own, a society, economy, and democracy that serves people and papatuanuku. Uh, Laura is also a board member Speak, which is a youth-powered organisation working to transform our justice system, and also the workshop, because, you know, she's clearly not got enough on, uh, a think tank that researches the best way to shift hearts and minds on important kaupapa. So this is how tonight works. In the first half, we're going to give each of our four speakers five minutes to give their thoughts on a basic income. Then it will be your turn to ask questions. Now, some of you have already sent questions through to us, and we have those, but you can also ask your questions live through whichever way you're watching right now, through Facebook or Zoom. Um, remember, you can upvote the questions on Zoom to help move the most popular questions to the top of our list. Also want to let you know we're recording this and it will be edited and posted on the Action Station Facebook page and there will also be a link available to anybody who signs the petition, which we will talk about later on. But I think it's time to get started. So what I want to do now is introduce to you the wonderful Sue Bradford. Sue is going to tell us where we are right now, give us a definition of a progressive basic income and describe what it looks like in practice. So in the privacy of your own bubble, please give Sue a round of applause.
I think we're needing to unmute you, so I don't know if you can hear me. There we go. I think we've unmuted ah. you now. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, kia ora, Michelle, and kia ora, Koto, and uh, kia ora to my fellow panellists tonight as well. And to all of you out there um, watching and listening to this, I've been involved in advocating for basic income since the early 1990s when our unemployed workers were here in Auckland, in Auckland saw it as one of the crucial solutions to poverty, to unemployment, um, and to a really broken welfare system. The COVID crisis and the government's response to it have opened a crack in the neoliberal capitalist business as usual model of government that we've had for such a long time. And Labour and its partners have already moved a long way from where they were. For example, with the wage subsidy, which now supports some 1.6 million workers, including some of us here tonight, I'm sure. Um, and with their willingness to, to borrow on, a, on quite a massive scale, issue bonds, and use other fiscal tools in a far more Keynesian and social democratic way um, than, they, than has happened for, for many, many decades. And so I think that this is a critical moment for those of us who support a progressive basic income to maximise the pressure that we put on government. However, one of the most dangerous things when talking about a basic income is that there are many different ways it could be implemented. Some right-wing forms of it are based on the idea that a low basic income should replace welfare, cutting costs to government, um, but at the same time pushing many people into deeper poverty than they are already. So we really have to watch out what sort of basic income we're talking about. If offered at a low level, like um, Gareth Morgan's Big Kahuna model was, many people would be a lot worse off than they are now. Details of any basic income scheme, how much it pays and how it works and how it's paid for are really important. A left basic income as I define it would mean it is paid regularly and in an ongoing way. That is not just for a short period like the duration of the living wage subsidy. It means it keeps going. It is paid in cash so that people can use it as they choose. Without the state or anyone else dictating to them how they spend it or having control over their income. There shouldn't be any reciprocal obligations like work testing or drug testing as we have in our current welfare system. It should be set at a level high enough to allow people to live with dignity, much more like the rate of super or of the current wage subsidy than at the level of the current job seeker benefit. Um, that's the unemployment benefit. If a basic income was set at the current single rate of super, that would be $423 a week each. The wage subsidy is $585 a week. The current single unemployment benefit for people aged 25 and over, and it's a lot less for people that are under that, is set at $250 a week. So you can see that there's a massive gap, and this is why the details matter. Adults should receive payments in their own right. How much you get on a basic income shouldn't be based on, or on welfare at all, um, shouldn't be based on relationship status. I think a lot of the people who are becoming unemployed just now are likely to be horrified to discover that if you're in a relationship of, of any steady sort and your partner is still in work, you're unlikely to be entitled to any income support at all once the wage subsidy runs out. A basic income would need to have add-ons for children, for disability costs, and for accommodation. Our housing situation is so out of hand now that until and unless we solve the housing crisis, additional help like the accommodation supplement will still be needed. Allowing for these add-ons for children, for disability, for housing, means that I don't use the term universal when I talk about basic income, because the basic income I'm proposing would not be at the same rate for all, so it is not universal, hence the difference in the language. I would suggest that everybody 18 and over should get basic income, but if you're living independent from your family, I think that should cut in at 15 or 16, regardless for, that, for the reason that you're living alone, uh, away from your family, because many young people cannot live with their families. A basic income should be unashamedly redistributed in purpose and in practice. Part of paying for it should come from a much more progressive income tax system. 
apart from other factors, a progressive income tax system would mean that the rich um, would pay all their basic income back and just automatically it goes right back into the tax take. So it's not as if the rich are getting anything out of it, for those that are worried about that. A basic income should also be set alongside a major government commitment to maintaining and creating decent jobs and to enabling affordable access for all to quality education and training. A basic income helps there as well, as people would be able to pick up study at any time of our lives without having to take on huge loans. Another valuable aspect of basic income is that all the unpaid work we do in our homes, on the rye, in our communities, would be valued in a way that helps put food on the table and values it in our work in itself, rather than being made invisible and demeaned in comparison to paid work. A basic income would also allow a flowering of creativity at a time when we need our artists, musicians, writers, actors, and other folks like that in the arts world more than ever. Cheers, Michelle. I think that's enough for me for now. Fabulous, Sue. Thank you so much. There's some really good points in there. Um, I like your explanation about not referring to it as a universal income um, because it would be at different levels of people with different needs. Can I just ask you one question that I think um, comes up immediately for people when, they, when we start the discussion about a basic income? This is a question that came in from Lydia. How would you argue against the idea of loss of motivation to work when receiving a basic income? Um, I think the first thing that we need to note is that paid work is important. Um, but as I've said, it's not everything. And it's high time we had a social and economic system that acknowledged the worth of all the work we do, not just some of it. But beyond that, most people during considerable parts of our lives really want to engage in the formal economy, in the paid workforce, and earn income for ourselves and for our families. There's an inherent um, satisfaction that we get as human beings, I think, at doing a paid job well, at getting decent wages, being acknowledged for our work, um, having decent conditions, working alongside others, and in the best case scenario, um, doing work that we love. We're the most fortunate people of all that can do that. Work in itself brings a huge amount um, of satisfaction to people in, in the best conditions. And a basic income is not going to change any of that. Even at a comparatively high level, a basic income will still be way lower than current wages. Say we had a basic income of $500 a week. The full-time income of someone on the minimum, just the minimum wage, which goodness knows is way low, that would still be substantially higher than the basic income. So the um, the drive to earn money will still be there, even if BI is at a comparatively high level for a basic income, it will still wait, be way below wages. A basic income would also change attitudes towards those really despised jobs that we're coming to appreciate at the time of the COVID crisis. For example, people like cleaners, care workers, supermarket employees, drivers and others would be in a much stronger position to demand higher back wages and better working conditions with a basic income. They'd be in a much stronger bargaining position with their employers. Cleaning a toilet will suddenly be worth a whole lot more. <laughs> um, a basic income would also mean jobs will open up more for those that want them. That is, the unemployed and underemployed who desperately want work um, will get find jobs in places where people who don't want to be in the paid workforce at the moment can leave the paid workforce. For example, if you're a mum with three young kids, do you, working income pushes you out to work at the moment. But what if that young mum would rather be with her children and leave that job for someone else who's unemployed and desperate for work? Wouldn't that be a better system? The fact that there would be no abatement clawbacks with a basic income also gets rid of one of the biggest problems inside our welfare system, which um, means that people are actually actively discouraged from getting paid work if you're on welfare because you lose so much of your benefit. People would have many more options in their lives and I think a basic income <laughs> um, would only be good for all of us. Yeah, so look, that's great. And I think maybe another advantage about having this conversation right now is that a lot of people will be experiencing that thing of um, possibly being at home, still getting paid, but not having any work to do, and the frustration and boredom of that. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Fantastic, Sue. Brilliant. So we're going to move on, but we will have you back, of course, for questions at the end. That's so great. Um, next up, we have Phil. Phil is going to talk about where money comes from uh, and how a basic income can rescue the economy and how we can pay for it without incurring more government debt. So please give a, an Inside Your Bubble round of applause to Phil. Cool, I'm on mute now, thanks. Kia ora koutou everyone. And um, just uh, following on from Sue's excellent introduction on the topic, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the, the macroeconomic implications of basic income. And what we're going through right now is, um, is pretty amazing because it's sort of like, we, we did this 12 years ago, only New Zealand kind of escaped it because we were able to piggyback on a uh, a lot of really superheated demand from China. So we sort of sailed through that and didn't have a whole lot of um, real hurt in, in economic terms like some other countries in the world did. This time it's different. We're, um, we're really caught in this like everybody else. And you heard the figures earlier, uh, possibility of 26% unemployment. So our economy is going to really, really go down as a result of this. There's no, no getting around it. And a big part of the reason for that is the economy requires a certain amount of money to circulate in it. And that money supply is over 98% created by banks when somebody takes out a loan. And the biggest chunk of lending in this country, like most countries, is houses. So mortgage lending is the lion's share of the money supply in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And that's about to take a bit of a tumble because when we come out of Rahui, the first thing that's going to happen is a lot of homeowners are going to look at their financial circumstances and say, oops, we need to downsize. And a whole heap of homes are gonna go onto the market all at once. A lot of landlords are gonna to want to deleverage. All sorts of things are going to happen and everybody, I think can predict what's going to happen to price it's predict what's going to happen to people's appetite for buying because if prices are going on the sidelines and wait for them to go down some more so we get a sort of a um, uh, feedback loop where the prices are going down people are trying to sell people aren't buying and all this means that mortgages aren't being written as quickly as they used to be and that means less money is entering the economy so all these stresses are going to feed upon one another and the economy is going to have far less money going around in it. This is a, a system called deflation and it will it'll just bite everything. It'll cause people to be very uncertain about making any sort of commitment or expenditure. Businesses will contract, possibly shut their doors. And the quickest way to get more money into the economy is to put it in the hands of people who will spend it. And that's ordinary households, families, people out there, and the, the universal basic income or basic income is the, the simplest means to do that. You get money into everybody's hands all at once, and you say, here you go, spend this, do something productive, and that keeps the economy afloat. That's the liquidity replacement for all that bank money that just disappeared. So that's one of the most compelling reasons why we're going to want this and we're going to want it soon. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's probably a good time to put a lot of public pressure upon the government because we have, uh, we have a little window here to put some policies together so that when we come out of Rahui and there is a, a significant downward pressure on the housing market, that we've got something to counteract that. We've got another force that is pumping money into the market and keeping things liquid and keeping thing, keeping people and families afloat, keeping small businesses open. So that's the um, sort of the structural reason behind having basic income. And that brings up the other question is, well, how are we gonna pay for it? Because that's gonna be a lot of money. That's gonna be the biggest, biggest government expenditure ever if we do it well and do it right. And this is where the discussion always gets hung up because everybody, in the conventional economic world says, oh, but the government has to run a balanced budget or they, they should be running a surplus. And 
they have to get that money from somewhere. They have to tax people or they have to go borrow it from somebody. And unfortunately, this is a bit of a myth and we'd like to bust that myth. And a number of prominent economists have come out in recent weeks with some very credible proposals for how the government can do just that. And it involves things like selling zero interest bonds to Reserve Bank, or in the case of uh, some other economists, there's the proposal for a public bank. And that would be, I think that would be Charlie Brown for the express purpose of providing the money. And it could be done just like the commercial banks do. And the government would then just simply hold the financial asset and the money would go straight into the economy. So there are ways to do this. There are ways to do this that don't involve debt. And we should seriously look at the options because the ways that we got into the situation are not going to be the ways that get us out. Thanks. Right, Phil, thank you. Um, look, can I ask you, this is a question that Noah sent through earlier. What are the things that are currently in the way of New Zealand moving into a basic income? Right, it's a great question because Part of it is the, the bit I mentioned about how will we pay for it. So we do get hung up on that, on that business of the sort of the conventional finance. But the other one that comes in, and I think Sue pretty well dealt to this one, is the, the motivation issue or the, the, um, the moral hazard. And that's the, um, it's sort of a common argument that's used in beneficiary bashing. It's when you say, oh, well, if you give people handouts, they become lazy. And, and you set up this sort of this, um, false meritocracy where people say, well, I work hard, I, therefore I deserve, or I'm a wage, er wage earner, therefore I deserve more than somebody who does unpaid work. And so it's countering those notions and narratives that is, is part of the, the conversation we're in now and saying, look, everybody can deserve this just for, just for being and just for being a participant in the economy. And this is how we get the economy through a rough patch. We get things floating again and then suddenly it becomes the new normal. Yeah, great, great, Phil, thank you. Stay there, we've got some questions for you to ask on the other side of this when we get to our, our group Q&A, but thank you so much for, for that, that was terrific. Um, we're moving into a slightly different area, but it's not really, it's very much related, is how students are supported to access education. So Isabella is going to talk about why students are calling for a universal student allowance and why the current system for students isn't working. So please welcome Amy. Well, tēnā koutou. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, the Secretary of Education, Iona Holstead, said, that COVID-19 has revealed the inequity within our system. It hasn't created it. And although, as Sue alluded to, the conversation and research about universal basic incomes and guaranteed incomes has been going on for decades, longer than I've been alive, in fact, COVID-19 has provided a really useful entry for discussions like these to take place. It has invited people-powered conversations about how we can move away from the status quo, which doesn't work for our planet or for its people, as we plan our recovery in the wake of COVID-19. For tertiary students in Aotearoa, this status quo looks like an individualised tertiary education system where a student's education is not perceived to be uh, a public good of humanity. It is seen to be a service for paying consumers or as a co commodity of value to the wider economy. This has resulted in a system marked by rising student debt, which now surpasses $16 billion. Added to this is widespread student poverty because students do not have access to enough income each week in order to cover their essential weekly costs. Students have either got to borrow to live and add to their loan, or they have to navigate the way through the bureaucratic layers of the welfare state in order to receive a student allowance. The system, which is designed to target funding where it is needed, does just the opposite. It means that many people who need the support can't access it. For example, those who have no relationship 
with their parents. And for many people who don't need it, they can access it because people can pay accountants to navigate their way out of the income thresholds that are required uh, in order to access the student allowance. In addition to not meeting the need, these layers of bureaucracy also result in the loss of dignity for students have no financial separation from the state or the luxury of choice to determine where their weekly income should go. The only solution to ensure that support goes where it is needed is to have it universal. However, in order to ensure that a universal system does not repeat the same mistakes, it must be universally accessible, not universal in the income amount. It must also be accompanied by a progressive taxation system amidst a suite of other reforms, an investment in public housing, an investment in public health care, and investment in public education. I'll end on the issue of public education because tertiary education across universities, across polytechs, wānanga and trades training currently stands apart from primary and secondary school education in Aotearoa simply because the cost is worn by the individual instead of by the state. At the high school I went to, at Ngāpōna o Waiorea Western Springs College, in Auckland, my state education was guided by the idea that education provides the tools for students to share in the building of a just and sustainable society. This is the idea that education is a public good. It simply means that the benefits of education aren't simply worn by the students alone, but also their whanau, their community and our nation too. We know that the more society is educated, the better off we all are. And to make education universal, we have to have a universal system of support. Now, Mihi Nui is a, that's fantastic. Um, you make some really good points. Can I ask you this question? It's on behalf of uh, Tuhi Ao, uh, a question that came in earlier. Is UBI better than improving access to and increasing benefits, super and family tax credits alongside wealth taxes and capital gains taxes and so on? Yeah, cool. I'll, I think that this question is probably addressed best in two parts. So firstly, on the question of improving access to increasing benefits, I think that as I've already kind of talked about and as the other panelists have talked about, the current system um, in terms of the targeted support and the current like bureaucratic layers of our welfare system don't provide the support where it's needed. Um, and I think that if we just follow the same model, we're not going to be able to get out into uh, and actually have paradise, right? And so, although Sue talked about the fact that the welfare system is still needed and that we'll still need those accommodation supplements, and she's right, we also need to ensure that we don't follow the same mistakes in terms of the system that we've currently got. In terms of the second question, the second part of that question, sorry, about um, wealth taxes and capital gains taxes, I think as all of the panelists um, have talked about um, in different ways. A universal system doesn't sit alone. It actually comes as part of a suite of reforms, including the implementation and the establishment of a progressive taxation system um, that actually enables A, to pay for it, but B, um, fundamentally, that there's a distribution or an equal distribution of wealth in this country, which is currently the key thing that I think is um, at the very heart of this particular issue. Great, Isabella, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And you two stay there, we'll have some more questions, but we have one more speaker to hear from. I'm delighted to introduce Laura O'Connell Rapira. Laura's gonna talk about why this matters to her and um, with some of her own personal story and why she thinks this would be a really powerful move to make. So uh, please put your hands together and welcome Laura. Kia ora everyone um, and thank you to my fellow panellists, it's been really wonderful to hear everything that you've been saying and really awesome to see um, uh, everyone leaving their comments in the chat. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd start by sharing a little bit of my personal story. Uh, for the first seven years of my life, I was raised uh, mostly by my mum who was on the domestic purposes benefit, the DPB, 
Uh, I was born in 1988, so I was three years old when the government passed the mother of all budgets. Um, at the time, the finance minister, Ruth Richardson, um, believed that jobs would somehow miraculously appear if she slashed the unemployment benefit and the family's benefit and the sickness benefit which obviously is a very strange belief to think that cutting support to sick people, solo parents, working class families somehow results in them, um, you know, living happier, healthier lives. But it is an ideology that has pervaded labor and national policy around welfare ever since. Um, so at that time, I, my mum and I live with my granddad and my auntie in Mangere. Um, there were a lot of families in our neighborhood who were reliant on income support during that time. Uh, in South Auckland in the 1980s, unemployment was 40 to 50 percent. The stock market crash in 1987 meant there was, you know, a huge amount of job losses. Factories were being shut down. Factory, uh, sorry, factories were being shut down. Freezing works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, similar to the situation that we may be facing as we come out of COVID-19. Um, for my Fano, the only reason we were able to survive is because we had the support of Fano. You know, because we had my granddad and my auntie that we could live with, but of course not everyone is, is that lucky. Um, and so the 1980s began what is commonly referred to as sort of neoliberal economics, but I like to describe it more um, specifically because I think sometimes that's a term that people don't, we don't actually know what, a lot of people don't actually know what that means. And so what I like to describe that as is the beginning of a period of low wages, eroded benefits, high housing costs, and, you know, basically for my entire life, people in government have underinvested in key services like public housing, like income support, and instead successive governments have actually prioritized policies that help people who are already well off. Um, property speculators are the obvious example there. A Herald investigation last year found that property speculators were making an average of $70,000 a sale, while most families in New Zealand have housing costs that take up over half of their income. So that inequity that is baked into our economic system is gross and enduring. Um, and yet at the same time, for the past two elections, polling has shown that New Zealanders consistently rank child poverty as one of their number one concerns. But our societal tendency has been towards supporting um, what I would describe as band-aid solutions. You know, there are a lot of people who would rather buy eat my lunch than actually redistribute wealth in this country. And that is actually understandable because people have been living for 30 years with really regressive economic policy and also an onslaught of lazy beneficiary bashing from opportunistic politicians who use that um, rhetoric to win votes. Um, in order and also to cover up government failure or government neglect of those key public services. But of course, now with COVID-19, I do think that um, there are more people than ever who are relying on government support um, for their income, to pay their bills, to pay for their house, to pay for their rent and their mortgage. And I think that means that we have a window of opportunity, um, but also a window of public empathy in which people can or people have become awake to the fact that actually it is very easy to end up needing government support through um, no fault of your own uh, because societal conditions have meant that you end up uh, in that situation because of a relationship breakdown whatever 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 and so I think that we have this window where bold and necessary economic change uh, can happen and I think a generous basic income could be one of those changes um, personally, I'm of the view that a guaranteed basic income would be harder for governments in the future to undo than just increasing benefits. I think that for the past 30 years, benef beneficiary bashing has had this sort of bipartisan status where both Labour and National engage in it. Um, neither National or Labour have proven that they are willing to take the, the make the necessary changes to actually fix our welfare system so that it works. And at the same time, superannuation has managed to achieve this kind of a similar bipartisan status, but in that it won't, it won't be touched. So both John Key and Jacinda Ardern in their prime ministership have said, uh, we will not do anything to superannuation while I am in power. Uh, and so I think if we were to implement a basic income for all New Zealanders, it would be much harder to take away than rolling back increases to benefits in the future. I think voters would be um, would get used to having a basic income, and um, if a future government were to take it away, I think voters would fight against it being rolled back. I also think that a universal basic income or a basic income guarantee taps into this egalitarian idea that New Zealanders have about ourselves, um, that we hold really core as a value. Um, 
But all of that said, that is just a theory, of course. And to be honest, if the government were to significantly increase core benefits tomorrow, I would be absolutely elated. Um, all of that said, I think it's important to remember that increasing income support is really only solving one part of the, of the problem. Um, we also need to be advocating for the government to put a cap on rents and mortgages uh, so that nobody is spending more than 25% of their income on housing at any given time. We also need to be advocating for a massive public investment in because if we only increase income support, but we don't build more houses and reduce the cost of housing for, um, for all people, then all we are doing is lining the pockets of property managers, landlords and bankers, which is not something that we want to do. No, we don't. Fantastic, Laura. Thank you so much. Um, here's a question that came through from Paul. How do we make this happen? Um, what are the best tactics to achieve change? Should we be camping on the steps of Parliament, storming in the streets, sending off petitions? What, what do you think is the, the plan of attack? Um, I think, so there are a couple of different ways that folks can take action. Um, and I'll ask my colleagues, uh, Cassie and Elliot, to share the relevant links on Facebook and Zoom so that people can follow up and take these actions. Um, the first one is that Action Station has set up a tool that enables people to write to MPs to show your support for the government to increase and individualise core benefits. So Sue talked about this at the beginning in her discussion, but basically right now, if a person is considered by the state to be in a relationship in the nature of marriage, then work but what that actually means in practice is that a person who's been dating say six weeks or a person who has a partner who comes over and stays for three nights a week um what can end up happening is that um if wins finds out about that they can cut their financial support because they consider you to be in a relationship in the nature of marriage in which you are financially dependent on that person and i don't know about you but i've never been ready to become financially inter interdependent with someone after just six weeks of dating and that outdated law currently affects 300,000 people in New Zealand, but could be you know, changed tomorrow. And so we've set up this email tool that will enable you to write an email to the government to say, um, hey, we would really love it if, if you're not willing to go all the way with the basic income, take on board one of the core principles of the basic income, which is that all individuals, regardless of their relationship status or their means testing or their working conditions, are entitled to income support. Um, so that could be an action you take right now. Of course, if you haven't already signed the um, petition uh, for a basic income, I would ask that you please do and please share that with as many people as possible. You can also donate to the campaign for a basic income. Um, but of course, if you have some kind of specific skill that you would like to volunteer, graphic design, research, writing, digital community organizing, um, social media, any of those sorts of things, we would really welcome that kind of support and just feel free to get in touch with us at Action Station through our Facebook page or via email. Superb, great, Laura. Can I just check in that I've been with my partner for 20 years and we still don't have a joint account, so. <laughs> um, look, it's time to head to the questions for the audience, from, from the audience, and um, they've been beautifully gathered from Facebook and from Zoom and put together. I wanna to say already thank you to Elliot and Cassie for doing that. The first question, if you have a question that you want to ask and you want to ask it to someone in particular, please say so, but otherwise I'm just gonna chuck it at the four of these wonderful people and we'll see who, um, who wants to answer it. The first one is from Argenia. I'm curious about costs of giving all New Zealanders basic income compared to the costs of administering the current welfare system. In fact, does anyone know what percentage of the current welfare budget gets taken up by the micromanagement of WINS? Did you all hear that question? And you might need to un unmute yourself if you want to jump in and answer that. I, I would have expected this to be a good one for Sue. Um, Sue, do you, do you have that figure off the top of your head? I don't either, but um, any, any argument for a basic income is usually to streamline the process. As soon as you re remove all the means testing, all the requirements, all the background checks, all the, uh, you mean, the nanny state component, and, and you know these horrendously intrusive measures, it's a lot simpler. Just sending an electronic deposit to everybody's bank account 
is practically free in terms of overhead. You don't need uh, a huge uh, department of staffers to go over that. Now, things like things like top ups, things like um, matching uh, the payments to requirements. Yes, that's going to still be a wins like function, but the, the basic payment doesn't require anything. Great. So the other thing that I would add to that, um, just quickly, sorry, the other thing I would add to that is that it's um, really difficult to calculate because it's not just the costs of um, the administration, it's also taking into account the, um, the costs to people who are being um, spied on, essentially, by the state or investigated. When you think about the stress costs involved with that, the, um, the, fact, the loss in productivity, the, it's, it's all of those sorts of things that are very, very difficult to quantify. And so I think, um, yeah, from my perspective, it's, it's, it's good to think about it from a values base. Like, do we want the type of uh, welfare, do we want the type of income support system in which people are being investigated to find out whether or not they are in a relationship in the nature of marriage? No, we don't. Um, I'm going to throw, move on to our next question because I want to fit in as many as I possibly can. This question is from Desmond. Will a UBI be, to some degree, I'm going to say that again, will a universal basic income be, to some degree, a subsidy to employers that lets them pay a lower wage than they might otherwise have to? Yes, Sue. Um, as I was talking about before um, in relation to whether people would still want to work or not, I actually think that basic income puts, it does shift the balance of power between workers and employers, and particularly for people who are currently very low wage workers, um, because, because people will have this greater safety net going on, it puts them in a stronger bargaining position um, with employers. Um, in, in particularly in relation to work that people don't really want to do, the nasty work, um, the hard work, the work that um, people are reluctant to do, um, like like the cleaning and the uh, you know certain other jobs. Um, so I think that it it's not a subsidy to employers. Um, in fact, it's it's it works the other way around. Um, yeah, given, it given makes you less vulnerable, right? Yeah, yeah. It is about the whole. The whole advocacy as, I, as we are for a progressive or left wing basic income is about redistributing wealth and power in our society. And as um, others here have said, it, it's only one strand of it. And it's really important that we don't just grab on the basic income and see it as the only answer. I've seen that a lot of people do that over the years and say, oh, look, this is the answer to everything. It's not. It's just one strand. We do need these other... Or, um, some people put up an argument and say that is it basic income or should it be universal basic services? You know, that is state investment in education, health and um, housing and so on. We actually need both and it's part of um, it, it's part of shifting inequality into a far fairer society and having universal services and having an income that's a safety net for everyone without prejudice. And um, unless we see it in that overall way, um, pick, only pick it out in pieces. Um, it won't work, you know, if we if we only see basic income as a standalone solution. Yeah, I just want to toe talk with that from so about the point about the a lot of the time it's it's pitched as a UBS, which is universal basic services, versus a UBI, which is a universal basic income. Um, but we do need both. And the addition that I would make to what Sue said, um, which I know Sue would agree with, is that um, currently. Um, Māori, for example, and a lot of other people from marginalised backgrounds are being are already being let down by our existing services that are provided by government. And so from my perspective, um, a move towards a universal basic services also needs to be coupled with some form of constitutional transformation. And so what I mean by that is the Crown um, living as the treaty, Te Tiriti o Waitangi always intended, which is operating in true partnership with iwi and hapu to deliver on those services. Because we know that the Crown services um, suffer from institutionalised racism, and we know that it is people of colour and Indigenous people that um, face the sharp end of the stick of the institutionalised racism. We also know that a lot of the Crown services suffer 
from structural discrimination towards people with disabilities. And so we, the Crown needs to get better at devolving power resources to those communities so that those communities can serve their communities more effectively. Um, and that's why I think we need to be thinking of the basic income as just one part, one ingredient in the overall pot of what it is that we need uh, to build an equitable, just and fair society. Laura. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, question from Elin. How seriously is the UBI being considered right now as a way forward? I see it being discussed only in my own ideological circles, but I haven't seen it discussed in any of Jacinda's updates. It seems to me that it would solve all the current issues regarding unemployment, student welfare and so on. Um, I'll just quickly jump in there with one thing to say, which is that actually Grant Robertson has been on the record saying that um, a basic income is one of the options that is being considered and discussed in Cabinet, which is really great. So I feel really hopeful about that. Mm -hmm. I also know that when um, prior to the last election, Labour um, commissioned a um, discussion paper. Um, uh, for part of their future of work project because they were thinking about you know automation in the future and what are some of the things we're going to need to do to make sure everyone has what it is that they need to live well and one of the papers that they commissioned was around um, the basic income so we I do know that it is being discussed by people with the power to implement it. Yeah great I think we can zip on to the next question I'm really conscious of time um, but that sounds incredibly hopeful uh, Chris asks, I'm interested in whether the panellists have a view on the idea of a job guarantee, as the likes of Warren Mosler or Bill Mitchell advocate. Why is a UBI better? Could a job guarantee sit alongside a UBI or replace it? Anybody? Yeah, Sue, so, can we, uh, yes, great, gotcha. Yeah, I have problems with the unmute sometimes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've been challenged on this a lot, and because I'm such a strong supporter of um, local economic development, of job creation in our communities, by our communities, of collective new, and new, um, really old ways of working where we create jobs ourselves, and, um, and many new options of work, um, I think um, really uh, deep uh, consideration of solutions around job creation that does social and ecological good and in all our communities across uh, rural and um, urban uh, Aotearoa as well, is really important. Um, so I was very interested in the job guarantee idea. idea. Um, I'm not sure which versions um, the person asking the question is talking about, um, but ones I've seen in America have really made me very nervous because some of them remind me of work for the doll schemes, which is something we fought long and hard in the unemployed movement um, back in the 80s and 90s, which is the idea of paying people, um, basically paying them the dole and expect them to work full time um, or part time for the benefit, for the dole. And um, basic income runs straight up against that. Um, we're supporting basic income, we're saying that's without forcing people to into work, into the equivalent of paid work for it. Um, so I, I strongly, I'm very apprehensive of what a job guarantee might mean Whereas I'd welcome any government, whatever you call it, a government commitment to maintaining jobs and creating jobs that are paid at decent wages, um, that are up to full time work and that where you are able to be unionised and where it's not like under a reciprocal obligation. So it really depends what you're talking about here. The next question is also for you, so, so don't mute yourself for a second. It's from Louisa. A significant advantage to a UBI is the fact the universal is the fact the universality of it results in greater social buy-in, as we can see with super. If it wasn't universal as Sue proposes, would you risk losing this advantage? No, it's um, I quite like um, what Laura. I think it's Laura's calling it guaranteed basic income. Um, it's it's another way of casting it that I think would be quite useful. And that it would apply to everyone um, in, in the way I, I put it forward at the moment, to everyone 18 and over or, or from 15 or 16 up if you're living away from home. Um, so whoever we are, we get it. So in that sense, it's, it is universal for everyone. But why I don't call it universal is because I say that we absolutely would need add-ons for people with disability costs for each of our children and and for accommodation costs, at least until we have a far better housing situation going on in this country. Yeah, yeah, understood. <laughs> All right, 
Does can I just add one point? Yes. Sorry, I just want to add one point about the job guarantee. Um, I was just looking through all of your amazing questions, so I got a bit distracted and didn't jump in earlier when we were talking about that. But one of the things that I think about is um, uh, I share Sue's concerns about not wanting to recreate work for the Dolls games. Um, but I also know that um, you know there is massive mahi to be done in order for us to reach the challenge of the climate crisis over the next little while. And I also know that low carbon jobs are the ones that will that are the least well paid. And so what I mean by that is um, it's the people who provide care in our societies, the people who are healers, the people who are teachers. If we were to have some kind of green slash care job guarantee in which we prioritise low carbon jobs such as teaching, caregiving, nursing, etc. Um, uh, but also the folks who are going to be building the kind of green economy and infrastructure into the future, then I think um, a, a, job, a green slash care job guarantee that sits alongside uh, a basic income guarantee is something that could work really well. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. Our next question is from Rangi Marie. How do you address inflation? Not that inflation is inherently bad, but more the fact that it will reduce the purchase power of the dollar that may leave people in an unequal in an equally precarious position over time very badly read question phil do you think you want to take that one yeah um inflation is not going to be something we worry about for uh several years i think um at least for the next couple of years as we climb out of this deep deep recession and probably for a considerable period after that it's I wouldn't be surprised if I never see inflation again in my life. Um, that's, you know, and I'm not like super old, but it's, um, yeah, deflation is what we're up against right now. And a, a lot of us, most of us have never seen it. The last time the world really saw major deflation was in the Great Depression. So um, a lot of people aren't prepared for what is likely to happen. And the thing is, when, if, if the government does start creating a lot of money and gets a lot of liquidity out there, if there's so much money sloshing around that it's driving up prices, that just means the taxes are too low. So the, 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 other, the other leg on the stool, because you've really kind of got a three-legged stool where you've got, uh, you've got a basic income, you've got the, the building and investment part of what the government needs to do, and then you've got taxation. And the taxes need to be set in a way that takes the excess out where it accumulates. And that's gonna be in assets. It's gonna be in things like land and places where, the, places where the money's been flowing over the past 10, 20, 30 years, but also on behaviors that we need to discourage. So that's gonna be carbon taxes. That's gonna be emissions, pollution, waste minimization. So you know, you just, you find the settings for these taxes. And so if there's a whiff of inflation starting to build, the taxes will tamp it down. Okay, great. I feel like I understood that, Phil, which is great, because you know what I'm like with the economics. I feel happy. Um, this next question is from Jim. Do the panelists think that uh, basic income would result in a significant redistribution of wealth in New Zealand, and should it? I'm staring think, at you, um, Sue, but you know, go, Laura. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think Sue made the point, good point earlier, which is that um, there are proponents of a basic income from a from the perspective of cutting costs in other areas of government spending, uh, which is why we need to be very explicit in the advocacy that we do for a basic income, that it is based on a principle of um, redistributing wealth so that everyone has enough to live well. Yeah. yeah and reducing the inequality in our society is a very, very deliberate strategy, which is why the tax part of it and the whole question of around how we pay for it is so important. Um, because often the right wing proponents will put up um, a low basic income alongside a flat tax. And a flat tax is, is a tax that actually um, is best for the rich and worst for the poor. <laughs> so um, you have to be very careful on both sides of, of that equation. Yeah. This next question is from Nina. Are there any countries who have successfully implemented the UBI? Uh, so I, uh, quick, quickly, um, as far as I know, there's, there haven't been any countries. There have been a lot of pilot projects um, and there's a, 
um, website called, that is run by the Basic Income Earth Network, B-I-E-N, um, which run, has a, that's the international network of people and organisations that support basic income and they're running all sorts of pilot projects around the world and do good analysis of projects that have already happened. So if anyone's interested in looking at the details of the results of pilots, um, it's absolutely fascinating, all the wonderful, the many, many wonderful things come from them. So I strongly recommend that website as a starting point um, for looking at what those pilots can show us. Great, thanks Sue. This is a really nice question. But it's from Oliver. I like you, Oliver. Would a UBI partially pay for itself by reducing people's financial stress and thus improving physical and mental health? I vote Isabella to take that one. Yeah, I think that this is a really interesting question because I think that, especially in relation to mental stress and well-being, I don't want to um, single it down to one particular cause. We know that there's complexities in people's lives that exacerbate people's mental and physical well-being. And, um, but we do also know that if people were pro provided with um, the basic needs in order to survive, like that they're able to pay their rent and they're able to pay their power bills and they're able to actually function in society, and we see this every day within our student communities, then the, the mental stress and the physical stress um, is somewhat alleviated. So I'm reluctant to say completely, but I definitely think that it will play a role um, in beginning to reduce um, the, the kind of day-to-day -day stress that people face purely because they're unable um, to pay for their essential bills. Yeah, it's kind of intuitive, isn't it, really? All right, let's move on to, uh, let's have a look into the future with this question from Alex. How will the UBI evolve in 10 to 50 years? What's it going to look like for our children? How can it be sustained or sustainable? <laughs> this is a really easy question for this late at night. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I, yeah. so um, I think a lot about 2040 because that will be 200 years since Te Tiriti or Waitangi was signed and I think it's far enough into the future for us to um, think imaginatively um, but it's also close enough in the future that we can think about how we can influence what is going to be happening in 2040 and so if I could um, pick 2040 as the date to answer that question I think that um, I think that uh, we have an incredible opportunity to, um, if we think about the economic reforms of the 1980s and the way that they have shaped the life of the lives of people today, we have that same opportunity for the young people who will grow up in 2040. Um, and I think that um, I think that uh, what we what what this crisis has shown us is that the government. And, the gov and governments the world over have the ability to maneuver the systems that govern our lives actually very quickly uh, for the purposes of serving our collective well-being. And we must never let, we must never forget that. We the people must never forget that. And we must continue to hold our governments and the people who are elected to represent us um, to account and call them to um, implement the most imaginative and bold solutions uh, that, that are possible because what, what has been proven is that they can do things quickly. All of the things that we were told were not possible, you know, um, to, uh, uh, to, for people to be able to work from home, for us to put in um, place more systems that enable people to have greater access to our services, um, to slow down, to enjoy our own backyards. All of these things we were told were not possible because of some amorphous thing called the economy, which we describe as a natural phenomenon, which is actually a set of rules that humans have created and can change. Um, you know, all of that has been thrown out the window, I think, and that means that we have an, an enormous um, uh, possibility, there's enormous possibilities to shape the future in 2040. And for me, what that looks like is um, constitutional transformation, as I already mentioned, finally living into the promise of Te Tiriti o Waitangi, in which the Crown truly shares power with, um, so Tangata Whenua and Tangata Tiriti, people here by virtue of the treaty, actually share power. And they also share the responsibility for the care and um, uh, for the care of all of the people in this land and of this land itself. Um, and uh, and I think, yeah, I think um, we all have a role to play in making that happen. That's fantastic. Can I ask, there's gonna be one more question because I know that what, what part of what we're doing in this hour, we're almost out of time, but part of what we're doing is giving people the 
knowledge and information that they can take back to their whanau and to the the people in their in their bubbles and outside of them um with uh, the topics that people are talking about so much so the last question that i want to ask is are there components of the ubi that would positively support the ongoing operation of small businesses seems to be a really important focus for us just at this moment of economic crisis um, I think it would be tremendous for people going into self-employment or small business or trying to keep one going. Um, anyone that is doing that or has done it or knows how tough it is to survive at all often or at least in the part, in the period of the first six months or so when you're getting things going, um, it would make an enormous difference to have that security that while you were getting up and running and hopefully starting to earn more, um, you had this um, behind you. And I think equally it would be tremendously supportive for people who want to experiment with other models of community economic development, like workers' cooperatives or other forms of community-based um, economic enterprise, which I think is part of the shape of the green future that uh, Laura was talking about so in such an inspired way. And I, I certainly see basic income as part of a part of that mosaic is, is supporting people that want to um, be entrepreneurial themselves or with a small group of others around them. Yeah, that's a really good message to go and pass on to the people that we're talking to. In theory, we're out of time. Do we have to stop now? I'm really enjoying this. You're the most people I have talked to in three weeks. So it's very exciting for me. <laughs> so, I want to thank all of you. Does everybody want to hit, do you want a final word? I don't know if we're that kind of panel, are we? But do you, is there anything that you would like to say before we uh, we close it down? Isabella, don't feel like I heard enough of you tonight. Every word was a gem, but I want more. Oh, that's very kind. Um, well, I, yeah, I guess, um, firstly, thanks to everyone for coming on board and for um, sharing an hour of their time um, with us. It was a real privilege. I guess in terms of, um, kind of to reiterate what Laura said, like this is an opportunity for us to transform our society. Um, the 1980s, the reform of the, the neoliberal reforms of the 1980s have had a pervasive influence on my life. I'm 23 um, and the, all the reforms have impacted in terms of the cost I've paid for education, um, the type of public health care I've been able to access, the type of housing, um, the rental housing that I'll be in for years. And I think that now is a time to really reimagine what life could look like and to come together um, in the wake of this crisis and to really put our minds to what um, is possible if we all come together and utilise um, and, and use that people power that we have um, to create something. And if it's you know, it's not going to be overnight, but we have to we have to be able to to see what it looks like in ten to twenty years. Um, for that's really where we're going to see the transformation. So, yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. Fantastic. Any last words from you, Phil? I don't mean last words, and I like you know, <laughs> not in that way. Well, I that, mean just before we that, all go and pour wine. It, it, it sounds so ominous, Michelle. Sorry. Um, no, I I I love what. Um, Sue's answer to the to the question about about entrepreneurship because um, I've been a serial entrepreneur, and I man I wish I had had um, some sort of basic income support once or twice when I was trying to bootstrap a new idea and actually turn it into a going concern. And I think about the the Renaissance, the the sort of the, the this would be like seeding the the ground with mycelium and getting all those networks established and and all the mushrooms that would pop up. In, in a little bit of time would be just outstanding. You know, the, 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 the opportunities for people with good ideas to actually implement them and hit the ground running while not having to worry about uh, mortgaging the, the family home, you know, about going without, possibly putting their families into hardship. It's, 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 I think it's a game changer. And you put that alongside freeing the government from these shackles of conventional finance, which have ruled it for far too long. At the same time, the government could be investing into green infrastructure. It could be investing into thousands of homes that are fit for purpose for people to live in. You know, we could, we could have so many things done right in this country if we just put our minds to it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a great opportunity. Fantastic, thank you, Phil. So do, is there a last word from you? Oh, let's keep talking, let's keep organising, yeah. let's keep putting pressure on. <laughs> yeah. 
it's a time to organise and um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. This is such a great discussion and it needs to keep going. Laura, what about you? Um, yeah, just to reiterate or, or um, to talk about what everyone else has said, I really do think that this is a this is a, an opportunity for change. Um, I think that there is growing momentum. Um, ev <clears throat> excuse me about the kind of continuing to organise um, point. You know, the fact that. Uh, Almost 300 people have tuned into this webinar tonight. Um, we've had over 10,000 people who have signed the petition so far. We know that the finance minister is considering a basic income as one of the options for a post-COVID reality. Um, but we also know that there will be lobbyists who do not um, share our interests in building this fair and equitable future um, because they would like to protect their private profits and um, private wealth. And so um, we need to keep organizing, we need to keep talking to each other, we need to keep imagining together um, and together we can, um, we, can, we can change the world, change the country, make, make you know, <laughs> try not to quote Michael Jackson, <laughs> like heal the world, make it a better place, but you know, we can, we can make things happen. Yeah, brilliant, Laura, thank you. Also, thank you, um, Laura, to um, everybody at Action Station. I want to say thank you to Madeline, who has done an amazing job handling all the technical stuff of mashing Facebook and Zoom together, and to Elliot and uh, Cassie, who have been taking those questions in and feeding them through to us. It's just amazing. Thank you to all of you for tuning into this, for showing your enthusiasm. Um, get out there and spread the word. Uh, can I also tell you that there is, of course, the petition for a basic income that people can sign, and the link to that petition, oh, I haven't even started drinking yet. The link to that petition will be available. Once you close um, this webinar, the link will pop up, oh, like magic, so that you can sign the petition, and let's keep this thing moving. Thank you all so much. I've had a really good time. We should do this every Wednesday. I don't know. Uh, it's fabulous. So everybody take care of yourselves. Drive home safe. Matiwa.